is fuel for your body, your mind, and definitely your sport. But let's face it, nutrition is confusing and the expectations on girls and women to be thin and have a six pack are exhausting. If you've ever been frustrated with your body, confused about nutrition, obsessed with eating healthy or guilty when you don't, under ate, over ate, or overtrained, and overwhelmed with all the pressure, then this podcast is for you. Nutrition can be easy, you can take control of it, but it might start with letting go of control by asking for help and making a change. I'm Lindsay Elizabeth Cortez, sports dietitian and owner of Rise Up Nutrition, where I empower female athletes to overcome nutrition concerns and perform at their highest level, to stop being confused by all the mixed or harmful messages, and finally have confidence in your body as a fierce, fit, and fueled female athlete. Today's episode is brought to you by Practice Better. As a registered dietitian or health practitioner, do you ever feel so frustrated by the technology and the 18 different platforms that you have to use just to communicate with one client? It's like you need a way to host sessions, a way to chart, a way to invoice, to email, a way to schedule appointments, manage a calendar, send documents, et cetera, et cetera. You've got 20 different tabs slowing your computer down. Meanwhile, you lose your mind and you've got sticky notes thrown all around your office. Am I right? I've been there before too, but guess what? Practice Better solves that. As a registered dietitian who manages dozens of clients at any given time, Practice Better has been my solution to having a one-stop shop for everything I need to manage my clients and my business. I've been using Practice Better since the inception of Rise Up Nutrition, and I have only good things to say. It is the complete nutrition practice management platform for health and wellness professionals, complete with client management, scheduling and booking, billing and payments, programs and courses, telehealth and messaging, integration with food journals and exercise logs, supplement dispensaries, and more. If you are a registered dietitian, health coach, or anything in the health field looking for a better way to manage your practice, try Practice Better. To help support this podcast, do so by clicking the unique Practice Better link in the show notes to learn more and sign up. By clicking that link and using the code RISEUP20, you will receive 20% off your first four months on any paid plan. Yes, 20% off your first four months. Also, this is in addition to your first 14 days as a free trial, so you can explore all the features of every plan option. Remember to click the link in the show notes to support the podcast, then use the code RISEUP20, RISEUP20. Okay, let's get to the show. Hello, fans and listeners. Lindsay Cortez, your host of the podcast. I'm here today with Dr. Nikki Kay. Dr. Kay is a medical doctor with expertise in the field of exercise endocrinology. Graduating from Cambridge University, she is honorary clinical lecturer in the Division of Medicine at the University College London. Nikki's clinical and research endocrine work is particularly with exercisers, dancers, and athletes with a focus on relative energy deficiency in sport, or red S, and with women experiencing perimenopause and menopause. Now, listeners, I actually spoke with Dr. K a bit over a year ago on this podcast. It was episode number 38. We titled it Understanding Hormones for Female Performance. It was an incredibly insightful episode, and you will learn a lot if you go back and listen to that one. And I really, really value her work and all that she does for this field, which is why she's back again for round two of a conversation around hormones. So Dr. K, welcome back to the podcast. Listen, thanks so much for having me back on. And please call me Nikki. Okay. <laughs> right away, because otherwise every time uh, Dr. K, it just like, yeah, you know. Um, so now we had a fabulous conversation last time. So yeah, really looking forward to, to round two. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and so I want to be upfront right away. One of the other reasons we wanted to have you on right now is because you have a book coming out very soon pending when exactly this episode is released. It should be out this fall. The book is titled Hormones, Health, and Human Potential, A Guide to Understanding Your Hormones to Optimize Your Health and Performance. So could you tell us just real quickly, like what was your motivation for writing this? Well, hormones are my passion, you know, because they're so interesting, complicated, difficult, but I love a challenge. So ever since I decided to study medicine, you know, 
way back when I was a teenager. Yes, I was young once. I like to remind my children anyway. Um, I've always <laughs> been interested, fascinated in the human body, do a lot of sports myself, particularly dancing. That's my main thing. But it always intrigued me. Why, why does it affect our health and our performance? What we do in terms of exercise, what we eat, how much we sleep. It's like, what's going on? I wanted to know. And then, of course, it turned out actually it's hormones. And so that led me into my whole passion, uh, you know, being a doctor in this field for 30 years. So, but I came to the point where actually I get a lot of satisfaction and pleasure from helping people or supporting people. Helping sounds a bit patronizing. Supporting people, you know, like you do, you, you, a person comes and they feel they're not at their best. And so what's going on? And so I'm trying to figure that out. You know, it's really um, rewarding, of course, for the person, but also for me to help them find what that that path is looking like for them. And often it comes down to their hormones and they're not quite in sync what they're doing with their hormones. So anyway, so this is a long story, but the reason I wrote the book, therefore, was to put all that that I have learned over 30 years into a book, into a book to share my love of hormones, explain to everybody what these things, these amazing internal chemical messengers are, what's going on, and also to hopefully give people the tools that they need to get the most out of their hormones to reach their full potential, which will look slightly different according to your age. Because of my dance background, the book is, of course, divided into acts, right? Yeah, uh, <laughs> I like right? that. Yeah. Act parts. one, act two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> act one is telling all about hormones, explaining what, what the heck they are, what is this link between our behaviors and the hormones. So that sort of gives you the background, if you will. And then act two is going through um, Shakespeare, the seven stages. Well, he calls it the seven stages of man, but obviously it's woman as well. So, you know, because things change according, obviously, a child is totally different to a menopausal woman, for example. Mm -hmm. So the, there are natural physiological changes. And so, of course, then therefore you have to keep in step with your hormones and you're going to have to do things slightly different in terms of your nutrition, your exercise. So that's what the book's all about, giving people, you know, all the hopefully the uh, useful information, but also telling it in the story. It's not a textbook, you'd be pleased to know. <laughs> OK. Oh, I like that. Yeah, it makes it so much more, you know, readable for the everyday person. Yeah, I mean, it will have, I mean, obviously, you know, as a doctor, I can't resist giving you references. It will be factually based, so it's not, but told in a way I hope people, of course, will understand and engage with. And it's also got what I'm calling hormone stories, which are, they're not real people, just to, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, but nevertheless, you might read it and think, oh gosh, that does sound like me. It's something that people can relate to, but from drawing from the sort of, various things that have happened as uh, you know as a doctor and people I've seen it's not one particular person I'm talking about it but it's a combination of this is the typical sort of thing you would see in somebody who is doing x y or z so people can relate to that and see what's going on anyway so that's what my book is about that's why I, that's the motivation and it will be published the 28th of October I asked the publisher, please make it a date. I can remember that's my birthday. So that's why oh, I'll perfect. remember what it is. Um, <laughs> you can pre-order it wherever you are in the world and you'll get a 20% discount. So there's a, <laughs> a little incentive to get to your order in, in, in now. Yes, or my order will be in and I hope many of our listeners as well. Um, so funny you mentioned about the acts, act one, act two, because the dance background, I was over here thinking, oh, this must be a British thing to call chapters acts or something. Like no, no, that. no, it's a dance thing. I call them it's a acts. Dance thing. <laughs> and then within the act, there's a scene, you see? Yeah. Or, or like a play or like a dance thing. It's just something to give it a little, a little flavor. You know, it is a personal book in the sense that otherwise it would be just a textbook. But that's a bit boring, you I mean, know. This is your thirty years of experience and knowledge, and those stories, like you said, too. Are I mean, sure, it's not technically a real person, but I'm sure it really was at some point in time. Uh, out of your thirty years of working with so many clients, and you know, the benefit of a book like this is 
you're one of the experts in this field, top, you are a top expert in this field and not everybody has access to you, right? Even though you have helped many people personally and one-on-one, it's just, this book is going to be so, you know, give so many more people access to your knowledge and your Yeah, health. that's a very good, that's a very good point. I mean, not in the big headed sense, but as you say, I get, you know, I'm really so happy that I can steer people on the course to the best health they can be. But you're right, you know, I, I, there's only one of me and there's a lot of big world out there. And so actually a book is a good way of communicating, you know, some some uh, helpful tips, hopefully, and stories and things like this. Yeah, absolutely. And so let's um, give our listeners a, a good understanding and perhaps like a sneak peek so that they know what they can like build upon when they do go out and pre-order and get this book. Um, but let's start with like the super basic hormones. It's like one of those things that we're all like, oh, hormones, hormones. But like, do people really know what hormones are? Can you give us like a good definition? What are hormones? Well, uh, the word hormone actually comes from the ancient Greek, which means setting in motion. Hmm. So that's what hormones are. Because it, it does have a bit of disservice. Everyone calls them, oh, they're internal chemical messengers transported in the blood would be, you know, which, which, it, I which is true. <laughs> that's, I mean, that, that's what they are. They go traveling around in the blood. And the advantage of going around in the blood is you can reach every single cell in the body. So that's really um, important for, for the hormone action. But then what do they do? They don't just go around on a joy trip, <laughs> you know, in the blood. What do they do? They set in motion your physiological processes, because what they do when they do arrive at a cell, let's give an example. So let's give estrogen as a female hormone. So men produce it as well. But anyway, so estrogen is going around in the blood, the chemical messenger, the hormone. Now it arrives at a bone cell. And so then it goes into the bone cell. And where does it go? It goes to the nucleus, the DNA. Everyone's heard about DNA and, and genetics. It goes into the DNA and it says to the DNA, effectively, right, you need to make some more of this particular protein to build the bone. But when the estrogen arrives somewhere else, maybe it arrives in the brain. And now it will go into the cell and it will say to the DNA in the brain cell, right, you need to make some more of whatever, you see? So that's how it sets in motion, hormones set in motion by bringing our DNA to life, as as I put it, right? And it will direct what's going on. So that's why they're so crucial to your health. Because there's nothing more crucial to your health than, you know, gene expression, uh, when to produce which proteins and when. So that's what hormones are. Yes, they are chemical messengers. They travel in the blood, but they bring to motion, set in motion, uh, bring to life the DNA and regulate every single aspect uh, of our physiology. You know, from the neurological system, the bone health, the muscles, reproductive function. I mean, I can, you know, go on and on and on, uh, uh, gut health, et cetera, et cetera. So they've got far reaching actions. So, I mean, I know this, but when you really stop and pause and think about it, it's like your body would not function without hormones or function properly at all. Every, everything that your body needs to do to sustain itself, to live, to survive is happening because a hormone set that into action, set that into motion by telling your body what to do. You know, I think that's really quite profound. Yeah, exactly. So, so it keeps the body, it keeps the body in equilibrium and balance homeostasis and maybe where people are familiar with it keeps everything because our body, our human body is very fussy. You have to be a particular temperature and all this sort of thing to really work correctly. So hormones are fundamental, as you say, setting in motion, bringing to life the DNA to keep us healthy and stable. But the other extra interesting thing about hormones, so they're crucial for health, absolutely, mental and physical health, but also what about the, the, our behaviors, the stuff that we do on the outside, I guess, I don't know what I'm trying to say. And this is where I bring in another quote, Hippocrates, good chap that Hippocrates, 2,000 years ago, <laughs> he said that the surest way to health was if we could give every person just the right amount of nutrition and just the right amount of exercise. He was talking about personalized medicine. He was right, but he didn't know why or how. He It sort of makes common sense, doesn't it? Right. But he didn't know. But guess what? The answer is the link between what we do, our behaviors and our health are, again, the hormones, because the hormones will respond to what we eat. We've all heard about insulin, etc. 
They will respond to the exercise that we do. They will respond to how much sleep we, we get. So Hippocrates is right. If you get those things right, the right timing, the right amounts, then that is going to obviously give a, you know, a very good starting point for your hormones. And the hormones also will drive adaptations. So, you know, we go and exercise because we want to get healthier. We want to get fitter, right? But that is mediated through the hormones. So absolutely, hormones fundamental for health, bring into life the DNA and also interact with our behaviors and help us get the most out of those behaviors. We're all told, oh, you know, Hippocrates was saying, yes, do exercise, eat the right amount and, and everything. And but you will sort of think, well, yeah, but why? And that's why, because you want you want to make sure those hormones are as, as healthy and responsive as possible. Yeah, and it goes both ways to where your hormones impact your health performance behaviors, but your behaviors impact your hormones as well, right? It goes both ways. Uh, that's a two-way thing. Yeah. Listen, you've already preempted one of the illustrations in my book. There's <laughs> a reversible arrow, you know, it goes both yeah. ways. Exactly. It's a feedback loop. Uh, There are feedback loops with the hormones themselves inside the body, but also there's a whole bigger feedback loop. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so we can see how important this is for our health because of, because of this feedback loop and everything in your experience as a doctor over the years and focusing on hormones, like what would you say are some of the biggest ways that health is impacted through hormones or just, obviously we've already said it can be impacted in every way. What are some of the most like, common ways or or most impactful ways yeah 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 so i mean in the book and what i've sort of seen over the years is that there are three things sleep nutrition exercise i mean uh hippocrates mentioned the exercise and nutrition and uh, Macbeth mentions uh sleep it's the great the chief nourisher in life's great feast so but actually, most people would think, oh, she's going to talk about exercise now. But guess what? I'm going to talk about sleep. Okay. <laughs> right? Because sleep, it's like, you know, uh, it's like a, it helps the timing of the hormones. The hormones have their own personal internal biological clocks, time scale. Some are short, some are long, whatever. But they are running on a certain time, each of them. But, but also when we sleep, we sh- if we sleep in a regular way and enough, if we're trying to do it out of sync with our hormones. You can see it's like two things knocking against each other. So if you have a very poor sleep or go to bed very late, et cetera, disrupted sleep. Yeah, being a doctor isn't good for hormones, that's for sure. <laughs> when you're working in the hospital and you're getting woken up at three o'clock in the morning and I mean, wow, we know this, we know, but we know I have evidence of this, not just my yeah. personal evidence, but we know that shift workers who have disrupted sleep patterns, it's really bad for their hormones and therefore their long-term metabolic health, for example. So out of all the things, actually sleep, having a decent amount of sleep, regular sleeping patterns, my grandmother used to say, oh, it's the hours before you, before midnight. Those are the most important. And I always used to think, oh, that's an old woman, you know, old wives tale, my grandmother. <laughs> but she was right. There's a recent study saying actually yeah. it's true. The hours before midnight, really, really helpful. And so that gives us the chance for, to sync with our hormone, what the hormones clocks are. Cause actually it's at, when we're asleep, some of the most important hormones come to life. Oh, wow. Growth hormone, for example, which regulates our body composition and also you know so actually again if we skimp on sleep that's not great for our hormones and therefore our health so sleep is number one Mm -hmm. second one i mean second one equal nutrition and exercise but let's say exercise for a starting point so you know we are designed to move right we're definitely not designed to sit all day staring at our computer screens aren't we (laughs) right (laughs) sadly but that's the way of the world anyway so Again, there's a, a, a lovely quote from Hippocrates that if we don't, it's, it's the, the old sort of thing of about if you don't use it, you lose it, which is kind of true because the body is designed to move. That's why we've got joints and muscles. So if we don't move, that's not actually good for our health. And again, not good for our hormones. So it's, but it's, again, there are sort of always, I'm seeing, I think about people's behaviors often in extremes. On the one hand, we have the people who do tend to sit a lot you know, at the desk and don't move much uh, or don't like exercise. But also, you know, I think we both see 
people at the other end of the spectrum who actually probably do. There is such a thing as over exercise, too much exercise. So they're not giving their body the sufficient time to recover from that or take benefit from it. So the main message about exercise is do some and also try and mix it up. Mm -hmm. So as you know, we all have a tendency. We want to do what we're good at, don't we? You know? Yeah, we do. I mean, you know, it's, it's true. We're good at it, so let me yeah, do so more we're of it. Because yeah. it feels good to do it. You know, like dancers are very flexible, so they like doing flexibility. But actually, they should probably focus on the strength things as well, you know, and vice versa. So the main thing is mix it up and definitely do something you enjoy because that will help your hormones and will support your health. And then the third thing, of course, nutrition. I mean, I think we could have a whole talk about this for ages but you know again nutrition uh there are so many you know fads and things out there but just trying to keep it simple and keep making sure and remember it's for you personally what do you need not what maybe some celebrity is saying that this is the this is the diet that will bring you health and happiness and i don't know whatever you know so it's what's right for you because your requirements will be different each of us uh, according to our age, our sex, etc., but also trying to have again this regularity, you know. And we know that having big gaps when you're not eating that's not good for hormones. So, especially women, uh, of course, we have the female hormones particularly sensitive to any extremes in these behaviors we're talking about. So, going for long gaps without eating, actually, we have evidence from studies. This is not great for hormones. It, it increases stress hormone cortisol and decreases estrogen in women and testosterone in men. So again, nutrition is fundamental. But the encouraging thing is these are three things that people can do, right? It's not complicated. It's not complicated and it's not expensive. It doesn't mean you have to go out and buy, I don't know, loads of supplements and uh, all these things. These are things that you have control over. Unless you're a doctor on call in the hospital. But anyway, you know, your sleep, <laughs> yes, your nutrition uh, and doing the exercise. So that's, uh, you know, quite empowering, isn't it? To know, yes, I it have is. got the control. I can harness my hormones by having a look at these three aspects. That's a good starting point. Of course, one can go into all details and things like this, but that's a good starting point to look at those uh, aspects. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and it's such a good reminder and refresher to hear a medical doctor say this, because I know that, of course, many people, something's wrong with their hormones. We're thinking, what medica medication can I take? What medicine will fix this? And actually, our behaviors around sleep, exercise, movement, and nutrition might be the three most powerful things. Not to say that medicine isn't important. There's a time and a place for it. But these three things are some of the most powerful things to affect and positively influence our hormones. Yes, I mean, of course, there are medical conditions, hormone endocrine medical conditions, where yes, you do need to, you know, we do need to prescribe. So, you know, an underactive thyroid, there's definitely an underactive thyroid. There's no two ways about it. You will need thyroxine. And, uh, you know, menopausal women, HRT, again, there's no two ways about it. Whatever you do, I'm afraid if the ovaries are retired, the ovaries have retired. That's it. So there are situations absolutely where medicine, medication, whatever that might be, uh, hormone medication we're talking about, is required for a med medical condition. But even then, even then, for example, in the case of HRT in women, I just gave a presentation on this, even then you can still derive a lot of benefit from those lifestyle factors. It will actually enhance the effect of HRT, you see. So absolutely, it, there might be situations where medication is needed, but it's always a good start. You can never go wrong. You can't go wrong by looking at, at, at these things. That's always a really good starting point. And as I say, open to everybody. You don't have to have access to a doctor. You can at least get started on that initially. Hey fans, I hope you are enjoying this conversation so far and we'll be back to it in just a moment. But first, I want to pause and let you know that this episode is brought to you by the Female Athlete System of Transformation, aka the fast track to overcome disordered eating and use food as fuel to perform at your highest level. 
The Female Athlete System of Transformation is my unique program and proven systems to guide female athletes to understanding and implementing the proper nutrition for their sport, life, and health. Myself and my team of registered sports dietitians work one-on-one with clients to address their unique needs and counsel them through the nutritional and behavioral changes needed. Many female athletes who resonate with disordered eating, mental guilt around food and body, relative energy deficiency in sport or female athlete triad, amenorrhea, repeat injuries due to negligent nutrition, or frankly, just a lack of knowledge and understanding on their fueling needs have seen incredible success in the fast track. After years of working as a sports RD, I've compiled the most effective ways for female athletes to learn nutrition, be supported, be challenged, and ultimately find their success with fueling as fast as possible. So don't wait another day. Get to your goals faster by joining the Female Athlete System of Transformation. Look in the show notes or head to the website to book a free call and learn more. Okay, now let's get you back to the conversation. Enjoy. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I think another question that I know in reading your book, I'll get the full complete answer. But in in act two, you go over the different ages. Yeah. Uh, sta- yeah, phases of our life stages of our life. So from infancy, childhood, teenager, young man, young woman, middle age, o- middle age, old age and dotage. Yep. Am I saying that right? Okay. I'm a little embarrassed. I no, literally never heard of that word thing. Well, this is okay. Shakespeare. It's not modern day speech, shall we say. Okay. So anyway. Okay. I had to Google it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Just yeah. say, what is this? It's, it's almost that, I don't know. Why don't you explain to our listeners? <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, I mean, starting at the very beginning, um, you know, the child, you know, or our hormones are already being prepared when we're in our mother's womb, in the uterus, what's called prenatal programming. In other words, What your mother's doing or the environment she's in is already pre-setting. And so we have examples from the Second World War where there were situations of starvation that of the pregnant mother being in a starvation situation that was transmitted to the child's endocrine system so that it would be prepared for when it was born to cope with a situation of not enough food, for example, right? Wow. But the problem is... I mean, so that's a good thing, but where the problem arises is if there's a mismatch, because that tendency can be passed on through generations through what's called epigenetics, so the things surrounding the DNA. Anyway, I try not to get too sort of technical, but the problem is when there's a mismatch, and we're always talking about the mismatch between what's really happening and what, you know, so for example, nowadays, you know, children, there is an obesity epidemic, and because children are moving less, and there's definitely not there's probably surplus fast food available. So if there's a mismatch, if the child is born into a situation where actually that's not, it's not in a starvation situation, thank goodness anymore, but actually it's the other way around, then that's a mismatch from the beginning. We then go through childhood, that's sort of, um, you know, pretty much about growing. And then adolescence, of course, that sees the explosion in the hormones and the divergence of the sexes. So that's, uh, you know, a sort of, challenging time uh, as well for, for the for the individuals. You remember when your, your hormones are changing, you're not quite sure what's going on, but very crucial for bone health, especially in that age group, because those hormones are building up to what's called peak bone mass. Uh, so that's sort of teenagers, very briefly. And then we have the people who now is in their 20s, their 30s. And so actually what's the challenge there is probably now they've got a busy work schedule, social life, family life, you know, so actually there's a lot of stuff going on like that. And maybe they're an athlete trying to fix, put in their training. So that can be another flashpoint for hormones in terms of the challenges. And then as they, as you get older, Shakespeare's description is the, the judge with this expanding waistline. We know this as middle age spread, right? And because again, the hormones are now sort of winding down a bit. Okay. So there is that tendency with the growth hormone going down that, yes, you can tend to have the expanding waistline. But the good news is that you can still uh, deal with that by changing up your behaviors. So if you weren't doing exercise before, you definitely need to be doing it now, for example, and strength training. 
And of course, now we're moving into for women, the menopause when female hormones take a nosedive. So again, lifestyle, like we've mentioned already, very, very helpful and important, but also HRT is something that now certainly with women living longer, up to 30 yeah. years of your life will be in the menopause state. So, you know, you need to be making those good decisions um, for your quality of life and your long-term health regarding HRT. We can talk more about that if you if you want. And and then moving into sort of older age and, as you say, dotage. So dotage, Shakespeare describes as a second childhood. Uh-huh. So that is... So at the beginning, the hormones are quite low, and it's sort of like at the end, the hormones have also gone really low. So that's almost like it. Why it is a second childhood, you see? But again, still positive things. You know, I teach Pilates as well, and I had a chap who had a stroke, and we were doing exercises sitting in in the chair. So you can still do what is possible for you. So you still got those three lifestyle things, and you know, but you're going to have to change them according to what age you are. You see, because your hormones are changing, therefore, of course, you have to change up what you're doing. Absolutely. Even just, I think it's really interesting how the three things are important for hormones, sleep, exercise, nutrition, but it might exactly, you know, what you might do or what influences them positively during that phase might change. You know, even just how you mentioned, like, you know, with uh, maybe in your 30s, 40s, when growth hormone drops, that's when strength training becomes yeah, perhaps exactly, more important. Exactly. Quite. Um, even though it's probably, you know, the teenagers who are into strength training trying to build their, I'm thinking about boys right now, build their muscle when it's like, really, we need the 40 year old. Well, you're right. To, you yeah. Know, and, to do and, it. You know, yeah, exactly. I'm always Both getting uh, my, but... my, um, my eldest son is a uh, cycle coach and he's always saying to me, oh, you should do your strength training. He's absolutely right. You know, because your growth hormone is going down. So although I might not like it, you know, there again, there are ways and means. It's being flexible. I mean, I don't, I have to be honest, I don't go to the gym, right? But there are other ways of doing strength training. So it's, Absolutely. so it's finding what works for you, what you, what's, but, but rather than saying, ah, oh, I'm not going to do strength training because I don't want to, so I hate the gym. Rather, right. Okay. I know I need to do strength training. What is going to, what can I do? What that I enjoy that I can do? Because not everyone has access to a gym as well, for example. So, but the strength training is definitely something for, you know, the masters athletes and, and the older people because of the body composition, the, the dropping growth hormone, but also for metabolic health as well. I mean, yeah, listen, getting a little bit older. Hey, there are some challenges. Um, <laughs> but, you know, um, equally at the other end of the scale, the youngsters, the, the children, the teenagers who, think they can train or, or be encouraged sometimes to train like an adult again that's right. that's not going to work you see so it's that's not good it's again, for it, it, no it's so it's matching mm-hmm. up you know where you are as you say where you are in your lifespan where you are in this journey with what is going to work best for you with dovetail it with your hormones to get the most out of your hormones we talk about harnessing your hormones it's, you know they'll work for you if you work for them sort of thing you know mm-hmm mm-hmm Well, I love this conversation too, because I'm just reflecting on my practice as a dietitian and one knowing that many, and this is, you know, I'm, I do this myself too, just as a human where we are reactive, you know, like, oh no, something's wrong. How can I fix it? Or what do I need to do right now to fix it? And I feel like reading your book and learning about all the life stages, you can be more proactive in, you know, thinking about what's, co- what's coming up next for you, or what do I need to do now before, before this becomes a problem, or before my hormones are out of whack, you know, so I think understanding the full spectrum of hormones across the ages will be really, really helpful. You know, even just in my personal life, I didn't think about for I mean, I, I kind of thought about it through puberty, but not really because I didn't want to, right? Mm, yeah, <laughs> it's like I didn't want to yeah. think about what was going on. I didn't want to understand it. And then um, and then really, honestly, through my own personal experiences and experiences as a dietitian and working in the field of sports, sports nutrition, and then dealing with energy deficiency, red S, disordered eating is where like, whoa, hormones are playing a huge, huge role in this. And 
And again, hopefully I'm not jumping all over the place, but people would come to me think, you know, with what do I need to do to change my diet or fix my diet, adjust my diet. And and there are absolutely 100% things we can do. But one of the big reasons is because there's a hormone issue going on. And so how is nutrition impacting the hormones or how have your hormones impacted your nutrition? It plays such a key, key role in even what I do as a dietitian to, you know, to see what that situation is with that hormone panel. And, you know, I think the, you make a very good point there about sort of being preemptive or what we would say in, in medical terms, the preventative medicine. Yeah. So being on the front foot mm-hmm. rather than you, you put it not re- reactive. I mean, listen, the thing is also people, you know, things do happen, you know, and so you shouldn't be too hard on yourself. Um, You know, like (laughs) sometimes if you're stuck in clinic and you have every intention that you're going to have your lunch at one o'clock, but things happen and then suddenly, oh my goodness, it's three o'clock. How did, so, you know, things do happen, Mm -hmm. but in general, you're right. If you can be aware and be thinking ahead and athletes actually, you know, we're talking about, you know, you mentioned athletes, you know, they're very organized. You wouldn't turn up to a bike race, I hope, without your helmet or your cycle shoes and all this thing, right? You wouldn't turn up without with the wrong equipment. You know, you wouldn't turn up, mind you, sometimes I I did turn up once to a swimming pool (laughs) without my swimming costume. But anyway, you know what I mean? You you, you generally get the physical things right, but actually you shouldn't, you should be thinking ahead. What do I need to think about my fuel? Have I had the fuel I need before I go to the swimming pool and pack my swimming costume? And have I packed in there some, some hydration? Have I um, put in thought about what I'm going to have afterwards to refuel? So that's on the short time scale, but also that can extend to the longer time scale. Like, okay, now I'm sort of hit, hitting 50 or I'm just edging closer there. So I do need to be thinking in advance, what's this strength training? What am I going to do? What about my protein intake to prevent sarcopenia, the muscles becoming weaker, you know? And like we mentioned about HRT, it's going to happen. My periods will stop. Why don't I just sort of do my research there? So, you know, listen, life is busy, but actually when all said and done, the priority is, you know, has to be your health because so, you know, spending a little bit of time just thinking ahead, right. not just in the, in the short term for from day to day. Great. Week to week, month to month, and ultimately, you know, okay, now do I need to change things? My hormones are changing. Being proactive like that, you know, as you say, is going to really benefit you in the long term. Absolutely. Yeah. So I have, um, with the time we have left, I have probably three more things I want to touch base with you on. And you, you sort of offered up one of them of, you know, do you want to dig into HRT a little bit? And I don't think I've really had anybody on this podcast talk about that before. So I think it would be nice if you could briefly just share with our listeners, what is HRT hormone replacement therapy, correct? Mm -hmm. And like, what it what exactly is it? We're mentioning uh, menopause, like, what are the benefits of it? Can you just shed some light on that? Sure. So menopause, that's when a woman's period stop. Okay. And so they stop because the ovaries have retired. So the ovaries stop uh, their reproductive function. They stop producing eggs, but, and also they stop producing hormones. And that's really the crux of it. And the two ovarian hormones are estrogen and progesterone. Average age of this happening in women is 51. It can be anything from 45 to 55, something like that. Anyway, so there are consequences i'm afraid ladies uh listening of of your hormones of your ovaries retiring because the this drop in the hormones has can present challenges in terms of symptoms hot flushes brain fog changing your mood new onset of headaches and joint pains disturbed sleep wanting to go to the toilet more than often loss of libido so yeah i'm afraid there are some symptoms associated with menopause but also in the long term because of the low levels of these hormones the main cause of death in postmenopausal women is cardiovascular disease so you're now at greater risk to equal that of men sadly because estrogen is cardioprotective you see so you don't have that anymore and then we've already mentioned estrogen is important for bone so you're more at risk of getting osteoporosis so what are you going to do about it well definitely going to look at your lifestyle of course uh, like we mentioned because definitely that will help 
But then, you know, HRT, hormone replacement therapy, is definitely something you, you should consider. And for most women, the only group of women for whom it's contraindicated, so you shouldn't take it, is if you've got a personal history or very close family history of breast cancer because okay. that's off the cards. But unfortunately, what happened 10 years ago now, oh, actually it was 20 years ago, there was a, a scare story was put out. Okay. There was a study which the media got hold of and they reported, oh, HRT, it causes breast cancer. Oh. So this unfortunately led to lots of women, understandably, stopping taking their HRT. But then right. when it was properly looked at, because it was just the media story, when it was properly analyzed, what, do the, what does this study really show? There were some reasons why there was a higher incidence of breast cancer in these women in this study, because they started the HRT quite late, 10 years after the menopause, 60. And also they were already overweight. And the main risk factor for breast cancer is adverse lifestyle factors. In other words, being overweight, not exercising, drinking a lot of alcohol, smoking. That massively increases your risk of breast cancer before you've even talked about HRT. Okay. We have to accept that, yes, HRT, there is a mild increase in breast cancer, an extra four cases per 1,000 women. But that is no more than taking the contraceptive pill or drink, uh, drinking a moderate, you know, like um, a small amount of alcohol per week. So it's not massive. Right. There's risks associated to everything in life. So it's kind of one of those things of which one will you choose. (laughs) But also the good news is if you take, if you do two and a half hours of exercise or more per week, you know, relatively intense exercise, that decreases your risk of breast cancer by seven cases. Well, so if you do your maths, you're still better off doing the lifestyle and taking the HRT. And so HRT, what is it? If you haven't had a hysterectomy, hysterectomy, in other words, you've still got a uterus, then you must take both estrogen and progesterone together, okay? And there are various ways of taking that. The best way of taking the estrogen component is through your skin. So that's a patch or a gel. And the reason for that is that it doesn't have to go through the liver and, and complicate metabolic function. And then the progesterone... The best form there is what's called micronized progesterone. So it's exactly the same as what you produce your own body. So it's like an old friend, you know. Mm -hmm. And so so that is the conclusion that HRT, provided it's not contraindicated, is very, very important and helpful for alleviating those symptoms, the quality of life, and also for your long-term health. So... Lots of people, when I talk about HRT, they say, oh, you're very much in favor of HRT. Well, I have to admit, yes, I am. And I'm speaking from personal experience. It was really helpful for me. But also just from a scientific medical point of view, these are the facts I've just said to you. It's like, that makes a lot of sense to me. If it's going to help make you feel, enjoy your life, quality of life. And also, I know in the back of my mind, it's going to help my long-term health. It's like, you know seems a very good choice at least to consider it and really look at it carefully before you say, no, 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 I don't need that, you know? Absolutely. And, you know, because it's like menopause happening to women anywhere between 45, 55, you know, that's very young to be experiencing so many of these negative effects, right? Like maybe 500 years ago, we considered age differently to where, you know, life expectancy was shorter and things like well, that. Well, they wouldn't but... probably wouldn't reach there, you see, because exactly. lots, of, lots of the women would die in childbirth. Oh my so gosh, they wouldn't even too. know. Yeah, you see. So they, in the Tudor ages, I don't know, I'm just picking that as an example, but, you know, they, and certainly Hippocrates time, it was the minority that would be lived to 50. Yes, uh, and so they wouldn't know what, what was in store. And certainly they wouldn't be living a third of their life in menopause. Well, and exactly to spend 30 years Maybe. or more. Yeah. Or, or less, but still it's, that's, that's a long a big, time. This is Trump. a very different time that we're living in now. You know, women are still working and have, you know, children and yeah, sure. we're doing and still doing sport. Absolutely. And why should we? And we so should. Like, <laughs> and we should. Yes. I'm looking forward to it myself. <laughs> like, now that we have all this knowledge and information to to help support during this phase of your life. And I think it's really eye opening when you think like, oh, yeah, we're, we're going to spend many, many years of our life in that phase. And your life isn't over it's far from no, that and no, so exactly. the hrt is something you can do to feel good yeah, yeah, yeah. during exactly. these during these years so 
So this is really, really helpful. And I do want to touch on briefly because I, I believe it's one of the chapters in your book or yeah, it's in the red. Does that mean, is that a, a play that on is. red S? Red, okay. And, and I, so I, I wanted to bring to light that you do address, you are an expert in relative energy deficiency in sport. And that is in your book. And, and I wanted to just ask you real quick, because we've heard about like HRT being used in red S as well. Perhaps this is somebody who is younger in, you know, could be a teenager in their twenties and their thirties who, because of red S now amenorrhea is not the only symptom of red S, but it could be part of it. The effect that red S has on your hormones could be creating almost menopause like symptoms. Exactly. It exactly. is HRT a, a possible course of action there too. It is. So it is uh, effectively. Um, so amenorrhea, functional hypothalamic amenorrhea, FHA, which can occur in red. So energy um, deficiency. So there's a mismatch between energy that you take in and energy that you're spending. You're in a, a negative balance, effectively, like a bank balance. You're in, in overdrawn in the red. So this is going to, the body reacts to this by quite sensibly going into eco mo mode and looking for ways to save energy. And for women, obviously, it's not time to be getting pregnant. So the body shuts that possibility off and the ovaries stop producing a hormone. So in some ways, it is similar to the menopause, different reason, obviously. Different reason. Different mm -hmm. reason, but the, but the estrogen and uh, progesterone are low. So what are you going to do about that? So absolutely, HRT is recommended and there are certain criteria if the woman has had, so it's particularly for bone health we're worried about in this age group, you see. So if the, when you do a DEXA scan to look at the bone health, if it's below a certain measurement or if the woman has had two or more stress fractures, so you're worried about the bone health, then definitely HR, HRT is recommended. And this is in the Endocrine Society guidelines. And also, I'm very happy that also it is now in the uh, the NICE guidelines we have in here in England, National Institute of Clinical Excellence, it stands for, NICE. And so just to, I think it's a really important point you make here, that HRT is what is, we know, the most beneficial treatment not the combined oral contraceptive pill or the birth control pill. It's true it used to be given because it made everyone feel better. The doctors gave something and, and the, 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 the woman would have withdrawal bleeds, they're not periods. And, and kind of on the surface, it sort of makes sense because if you look what's inside a contraceptive pill, you'll see, oh, it's estrogen and progesterone. But they're not the types that the body recognizes. They're fake ones, right? They're not. So the bod the bone isn't stupid. The bone <laughs> looks at this thing and it's like, nah, that's the fake. Well, that's not the real thing. So that's why the contraceptive pill doesn't help bone health. But if you take HRT, the way we've described it is exactly the same as what you produce yourself. So the bone welcomes it in like an old friend. It's like, oh, yeah, sure. Come on in here and, and do that. So that um, the nice guidelines, they were saying the pill, but now because I wrote to them, the beginning of the year and said, um, you know, just politely, you think you want to change that because that's what the endocrine society is saying. And they, to be, to credit, they were very nice. They said, thank you okay. very much for pointing that out. They changed it straight away. No problem. Excellent. No problem. So we're all should be on the same page. Although of course, you know, not everyone is, is up to speed. So if you are listening to this and you've had that experience of going to your doctor, you got read, your periods have stopped and your doctor is saying birth control pill, then you can politely say, well, that's funny you should say that because, <laughs> you know, it's the enterprise society doesn't say that, isn't it? Exactly. So, you know, no, again, it's all about informing and being empowered and knowing that the, the facts and everything. Obviously, it's not the long-term solution. So, I mean, typically I would say to a woman that, okay, fine, let's HRT, probably a maximum of six months, and you still have to work on all the, the, the things, the nutrition, the exercise. So it's not a get out of jail card, if you will. But it's like you said, you still have to fix the reason that this yeah, you still have It's to not fix. the same as menopause, you know? No, no, exactly. Right. There's a different reason. And you and obviously the aim is always the same to get your own periods back. But just as a temporizing measure to protect the bones, that's definitely the, be the, the best treatment. 
Excellent. Excellent information. And so, yes, this this book and all about hormones can help with the, the red S and understanding that too. And I know we're coming up short on time. So I got two more quick questions for you. We have focus on the female athlete nutrition podcast. We've been talking about menopause and estrogen, things like that. But is this book for the men as well? regarding absolutely okay men men have hormones <laughs> they do <laughs> right um so i mean you know a lot of the hormone systems are identical in the sense of the growth hormone the thyroid function you know all of these hormones we well you know a lot of them of course are the same the big difference of course is in the sex steroid hormones but and where men in men of course it's predominantly testosterone but guys also make estrogen you know yeah. And actually, the, because the testosterone, some of it's converted to estrogen. And it's the estrogen that goes to the bone in men as well, by the way, you see? So yeah, men should, uh, men should also read this book. It's not all about women's stuff. I mean, listen, I have to admit that I, of course, have a soft spot for the female hormones because they're so complicated and beautiful, the beautiful choreography. So, you know, yes, but absolutely. And also I see quite a lot of men as well, uh, you know, as patients in my clinic. So, yes, I, of course, I see women, um, but, you know, there are men as well who gets reds, for example. Absolutely. Quite a, quite a lot of those guys. And, you know, uh, all the other things we, we've spoken about, this is all applicable to men. But the, the finer details, as ever, will be, of course, different between men and women, obviously. But, yeah, it's important that men realize that, yeah, <laughs> they have hormones too, and they're very important. Yeah. <laughs> yes, they absolutely are. Like you said, I think the female hormones are a little more complicated or interesting or there's, you know, the, I think complicated is probably the word. Well, yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> but, um, but all hormones in, in all uh, sexes are important. And, and we will not have time to go over this today. So a reason to purchase and read the book, but another section is called mind the gut. Is this how hormones influence gut health? Yeah, exactly. Wow. So mind the gut. Yeah. All my, my, I try to make them a little bit more interesting. Yes. So <laughs> mind the gut is the, the, the gut brain connection. Oh, yeah. But that, how does that work? And that, guess what, involves hormones. One of the main, a big hormone system is from the gut. All right. The enteroenteric endocrine system, as they call it. And all the, the hormones associated with the gut also associated with our behaviors around food. Hence the mind reference, you know, in terms of the hungry hormone ghrelin, the, the, the satiety hormone leptin, you know, so hormones are playing a part even here in, in this, this gut brain connection. And also I just dip in a little bit with the gut uh, microbiome and biota there as well. So that is, sh um, again, showing that hormones aren't just about the, the hormones about the gut and about the brain as well, of course, because, uh, and the connection between them. So that's what that chapter is about. Yeah, I think this is wonderful. Because when I think about my field of nutrition and dietetics, I think the the trend right now and where the research is going is really the interplay of nutrition and hormones and nutrition and gut health. Exactly. And, you know, these are two really, really huge things. And it also highlights the individualization of nutrition because there's so individualization in hormones and in gut health, the gut microbiome, the gut brain connection. So these are two really, really huge areas and how it affects your nutrition, how nutrition affects both of those. Like we said, that two way arrow mm, going back yeah, and forth absolutely. among all of them. So this is really, really exciting. So Dr. K, when, uh, well, we know when October 28th is when the book will be released and you can pre-order. Where can people go to pre-order, uh, purchase it, buy it? Sure. Maybe you could put it in the show notes. Um, Absolutely. Maybe. Um, so yeah. it's, uh, my publisher is Sakoa Books. So okay. there's a link there and that's okay. where you can pre-order it. And in order to get your 20% discount, you enter the code Nikki. Perfect. It will also be on, it's also on Amazon in the minute as well. So okay. you can go and, and purchase it there, but I don't think that's got, you can't get the, the code. pre order discount. I don't okay. think uh, okay. it's on the publisher website at the minute, but it will be on Amazon. So, and yeah, the, it can be distributed obviously internationally wherever you are. So you can get a copy. So yeah, I, I mean, obviously I'm, obviously I want my book to sell, but also I truly <laughs> hope and believe that the book will be of interest to people. And, you know, it's something you can dip into. 
I mean, even me reading through the whole thing when I had to proofread it, mind you, I had to read it really slowly to proofread it. You know, if you want to read the whole thing in one go, go for it. But also it could be a thing that you want to dip into. Right. It's, yeah. You go know, to the chapter that you need, the section. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because so, sometimes I do that. Sometimes I do that when I read a book. I read yeah. the introduction so I get a gist of it. And you might just want to dip into, oh, I want to look at that bit about middle age particularly, or I want to look about that bit in the red or, you know, so you can read it, of course, as, as you want is worth, worth what I'm trying to say, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So yes, sequoiabooks.com. The link will be in the show notes. A uh, code Nikki, N-I-C-K-Y for 20% mm-hmm. off should also be available on Amazon. October yep. 28th, you can pre-order Hormones, Health and Human Potential, A Guide to Understanding Your Hormones to Optimize Your Health and Performance. Dr. Nikki K, thank you so much for coming back on, sharing the the knowledge today and uh, and just telling us more. And I'm so excited to pre-order my own book and have this knowledge for myself too. Listen, thanks so much. It's always a pleasure to have uh, our discussions. Really love it. Thank you so much. I really hope you enjoyed that episode and thanks for listening. But before I let you go, I have free resources that you can have access to right away, right now, so that you can start fueling your body as a fierce, fit and fueled female athlete. First, I have your Red S recovery race. If you've ever wondered if you might be struggling with Red S, curious to learn more, or know you have Red S and are looking to recover fast, then you can head to www.riseupnutritionrun.com slash Red S and download the Red S Recovery Race. See how you place and figure out the next steps to recovery. Plus, while there, I have a few other great resources for you, including three nutrition secrets that every elite athlete swears by and access to our private Facebook community, Female Athlete Nutrition. So again, to gain access to all of this, head to riseupnutritionrun.com slash red S that's backslash R E D S. And you can gain access and get the help you need fast. Too many girls and women and female athletes struggle with nutrition, but you don't have to any longer become fierce, fit and fueled links in the show notes, and I'll see you next time.